Hi, I'm Shelley Tugas, Library Director here, the Hudson Area Public Library, and we are doing our segment on River Channel, Books Are Just the Beginning. And today, I'm with STEM librarian Christopher Mick, who is also the co-founder, or the founder, yeah. of Space St. Croix. Mm -hmm. So let's not bury the lead. I want to talk okay. right away about um, the exhibit we have at the yeah. library and um, Space Day, since that is coming up. It's uh, January 20th. Yes, uh, January 20th from 10 to 2. Uh, we'll be having special programming for that day. So the exhibit's available now. Uh, we got it uh, beginning of December. And so it's open to the public and patrons coming through. But we kind of had a soft yes. launch with it because there was a few pieces we needed to get fixed up and replacement monitors for. But uh, everything is up and running now. And then we were just going to do kind of a, now that we're into the new year, uh, do a special day just for the exhibit. So we'll be having um, some presenters from the Bell Museum I've worked with coming out, a few NASA Solar System ambassadors, uh, a lot of special giveaways and things uh, throughout the day. And yes. I feel like you're soft selling this a little bit. Okay, sorry. Because uh, <laughs> we are one of nine, is it now? Yeah, we're the ninth. Ninth library yeah. in the country yes. to have this exhibit. Mm -hmm. And it's called Mars, Moon, Moon, Mars, and Beyond. Yes. Yes. Uh, and, and it was put together by uh, a few uh, partner organizations. So NASA was the lead, yeah. uh, National Aeronautics and Space Administration, uh, uh, the National um, Committee on Interactive Learning. Mm -hmm and uh, StarNet Libraries and the um, uh, Space Science Institute. So those are the four organizations that kind of did all the research and the funding and the assembly and the production of all the, they're kind of museum style exhibits, kiosks and interactives and things. Right, so if people are thinking they're gonna come and look at some posters, what they yeah. need to know yeah, is right. this literally came on a semi. Yeah, big delivery truck and pallets and. Yes, Yeah. and, and somebody had to fly in from Colorado to help set it up and, yes. and get everything working. So this is yep. this is really incredible. Yeah, Ann Holland from the Space Science Institute uh, flew out to help me kind of get everything put together. Uh, there was, I applied for it about a year ago and uh, was notified that uh, I was the first runner up. And so it was only going to eight libraries uh, around the whole country. And so I understood it was very competitive. But I was told I was the first runner up and that they just received some additional funding from NASA. Mm -hmm to uh, add a library or two to extend the run. And so since I was the first runner up, they mm -hmm. said, you have the first right of refusal kind of thing on which you would like to have it. I'm like, of course I'd like to have it, so. There's no refusing that's gonna yeah. happen here. Yeah, so, um, um, so yeah, we're the ninth library to have it. I think there's, with the funding, they're gonna have a 10th and then that'll be the end of the, the run for, uh, for this exhibit. So very lucky to have it and it's amazing. Uh, I know you've seen a lot of the, the pieces, so there's, there's interactive kiosks, there's selfie green screen stations, there's wind tunnels, there's uh, mm -hmm. uh, a tomato growth LED hydroponic chamber that's growing space seeds so they can kind of see how things are grown on the space station. It's just, uh, it's very cool. Right, I think the most fun thing is to walk up to the top of the stairs, second floor where the little wind tunnel is, yeah. and I don't know if I've ever been up there and there hasn't been a kid or two or six. Yeah. <laughs> um, playing with that wind tunnel where right. essentially you just put a little parachute kind of thing in it and it f goes up yeah. and pops out the top and they are mystified and enamored to say the least. Well, it's very tactile and hands-on and they're seeing how the science works. They get the, the heavier they make something, the more it doesn't want to fly out the top of the tube. And if they're a little bit older, that's what's on the the easel sign next to it saying, uh, NASA engineers use these for to test parachutes, and different devices they're using to see how they'll work. Mm -hmm. Can you assemble the things in the uh, provided little uh, containers to make something so it will stay in the tube yes. and not blow all the way out? So yeah, the kids can just do the parachutes and, and uh, do that, but if they, they want to play with the science a little bit, they can kind of see how, how many things can they add and what's too heavy and what's not heavy enough and that and kind of get the balance, the interplay of you know, the wind and the weight and, and keeping it in the tube, so it's kind of fun. I think the other thing that's super fun that kids at Space Day or if families just come because the exhibit is up, um, it's been up for a couple of weeks and we'll have it through until March, so mm -hmm. um, you can come at any time. But the green screen where they can try on a helmet and a costume and then take a photo and position themselves um, on the moon? Yeah, they can pick their location. We have the space station or Mars or the moon or different other uh, space uh, backdrops. And that we have uh, for adults and for kids, the helmets and the gloves and the, the space suits. And then there's uh, little great clip things they can bring in if they want a, 
an alien or a thing they can pull in from the side of the screen to have that be in their photo. And uh, they've got the option to do a video that has a prepared script. So they can say, I'm speaking to you on Mars at Marineris, you know, crater or whatnot. Or uh, they can just do a selfie photo uh, and do that. So a lot of families have been having fun with that. Could I wear the library's um, Princess Leia costume and, and take a photo? Sci-fi is part of this. We have a whole uh, kiosk That's on sci-fi books inspiring people. You know, The Martian or 2001 or The Expanse or all that. So yeah, I think uh, Star Wars is fair game. For good, me. good. Well, I'm <laughs> even more interested in an intrigued um, for adults who are watching, um, if they don't know you, I can assure you their kids probably do. Yeah, maybe. Um, will you talk a little bit about um, Space St. Croix sure. and um, visits to schools that you do? Because yeah. I think that's where a lot of people in the community, kids in the community, get to interact no, with No, definitely. Uh, Space St. Croix, I started, uh, I started doing it in 2014, the programs, and then there was such demand, I set it up as an educational nonprofit in 2016. And yes, we go uh, free on-site programs at all public and private schools. We do the home school programs through the library. So I, I pretty much can reach every kid in the district uh, depending on what they're working on or what they're doing. It sh has changed a little bit over the years as we were just talking about like the third grade students had a space module and so I'd see most of the third graders uh, that year now just kind of I think shifted to fifth grade. And that, but I also host uh, or advise the uh, Hudson High School Space Club. Yeah, that's right. So they meet uh, after school on Mondays there. We're trying to get, it got uh, disbanded when COVID rolled in, but we were establishing a rocketry club, model rocketry club, rockets for schools at the middle school level. So we're trying to uh, find a teacher for that, kind of get that back up and running as another after school club at, at that uh, grade level. So yeah, working with the kids, uh, doing on-site programs for them, and it would tie into what the teachers are working on if they wanted to talk about a particular mission or an engineering or robotics or aviation or whatever they were uh, kind of right. focusing on that year. So we'd kind of custom tailor a program that would uh, feature NASA's resources on that and uh, do an interactive or a slide presentation or a Q&A, whatever the kind of structure was for, uh, sometimes it was multiple visits. Some of the schools grew the tomato sphere seeds and did that, you know, project. So they be planting them and contrasting and trying to guess which ones were the ones off the shelf and which ones were the ones that lived up on the space station for six months and uh, noting any differences in that. So it kind of just depends on what the school or the grade or the teacher yeah, is working on. We try to provide either them the resources directly or we'll kind of come in and help with the programming. This is probably a good time to mention that um, if any of the viewers are with a community group, a club, um, all ages, doesn't yeah. matter, they can arrange with you at the library to come and do a little tour of the exhibit yeah. and maybe even have some kind of programming attached to it with you. Yeah, we try to make it uh, age appropriate if it is a group, you know, of a certain age or grade level, um, our homeschool program. So if it's, uh, we've worked with 4-H and Girl Scouts and Boy Scouts, so yeah, any group that might want to come by and do, because some of the Girl Scouts are going for a STEM badge. Yeah. And so if they wanted to, to have this exhibit be part of, you know, get, earning that STEM badge, we could do a program where we kind of focus on an element of the exhibit, take a deeper dive on that. Can provide handouts and resources you know to the students and then they can kind of tour the exhibit on their own and then we can kind of do a debrief at the end on, on what are some facts they learned or what are some things maybe they didn't know before they right. they got here so uh be happy, happy to do that for whatever group i want to you've also because nobody is too old for space you um do off-site visits uh, um, from the library also yep. from space st croix mm -hmm. but um like Woodland Hill, yeah. you were there not too long ago, and so you're willing to do that for other organizations, other living centers? Yeah, it, it depends on the age group. The Woodland Hills, we did, uh, talking about the recent Artemis mission, I was able to go down and cover the launch for that for the Star Observer and, and do some articles for the paper, and so uh, that audience really liked the connection back to the Apollo program, you know, Apollo 11, and a lot of them had great stories for me watching that on TV or visiting Kennedy Space Center back in the 60s and then how exciting you know that yeah. time period was uh, with that going on and then comparing it to what the new Artemis program is with with going back to the moon and that so that that was a very popular program and we'll be able to do things on <clears throat> how do you eat food in space how do you sleep in space mm -hmm. you know uh, those things uh, home and garden club was talking to some people there that might want to do a program on that how do you grow food in space that would be a really cool tie-in yes yeah, so we were just talking about maybe doing a, a custom program on that for bringing the home and garden club members out to kind of learn about uh, how you tackle that challenge in, uh, in a zero gravity environment mm -hmm. so i i remember seeing video of the launch and photos and all those things that you brought back with you and you know not everybody gets to just 
call up NASA and say, hey, I'd like to come see the launch. Right. So why don't <laughs> like, you let people know how it is that you, I mean, you were there with like the national reporters mm -hmm. and, you know, all the dignitaries, like as close as you can essentially get right. to the launch. No, it was, it was an honor uh, to go down. I, I just had the idea that uh, kind of what you talked about, that that would be a great experience to bring back to the kids in Hudson that may never get to even go to Kennedy Space Center at all. Mm -hmm let alone to a historic launch like that. And I thought this is coming up, uh, this would be a great thing to document and get all the information back and, and do that. And I, I had written some articles over the years as a contributor for the Star Observer on interviewing an astronaut or something uh, STEM related uh, that I thought might appeal to the paper and they would graciously be running those stories and, and happy to get them. And so I, I uh, pitched the, the editor of the paper on that idea of um, you have to kind of submit an application and it's a vetting process and you're not guaranteed to be approved just because you put in a request for press credentials and, and they supported that wholeheartedly. They thought that'd be a great thing yeah. to do a series of stories on Space St. Croix and, and teaching in schools and on covering this kind of historic launch and, and the context of it. So uh, they supported it and I put in the application and it, it took uh, three months or so and then I wow. heard, heard back that uh, I was accepted and issued credentials and then, uh, yeah, as you were saying, uh, you get a lanyard which gets you access for interviewing uh, staff and astronauts there and the engineers mm -hmm. and the facilities and you're at the press site and yeah you're hearing French and German and, yeah. and different accents because they're all reporting back to their you know feeds when they were doing uh, either a live stand up or, or transmitting copy back for a written story and so you knew it was a very international not just you know United States interest, but it was, it was pretty cool. So you're in the press room, and it's like CNN, Anderson Cooper, and Christopher Mick, Hudson what, Star. It wasn't quite that, yeah. They, but you would hear, you'd kind of <laughs> laugh in your head because we're in the press room, and they're, they're, uh, when they did the press briefings, there's only about 50 people that could fit in there. So they tell you it's kind of a first come, first serve for that area. So at the at the press briefing right after the successful launch, I, I really wanted to get a seat in there because I knew that was the last chance we were going to get to talk to everybody about you know the launch and that. And I got a seat. But when they're picking the people asking, yeah, you're hearing you know, Reuters, CNN, <laughs> USA Today, you know, things like that, Wall Street Journal, and you're like, I'm, I'm Hudson Star Observer. I, I don't know how I'm in this room. But yeah, I got to ask a, a yeah. question at the briefing and, uh, uh, and it was great. So everybody was very helpful. The other reporters uh, were very kind on kind of showing me the ropes for how mm -hmm. this all works and the NASA staff was awesome for same kind of thing uh, a newbie not knowing exactly where from where to park to where to sit to, to what to do so uh, mm -hmm. it was a great great experience it was it was no sleep but but it was a great great experience. Well and the Star Observer is incredible they do so many great things in our community and so that they worked with you on this is yeah. it's just awesome yeah. but um, you know, you're not a stranger to NASA and space education, so would you explain a little bit of your connection and background with NASA? Um, yeah, it, it, it kind of extended from starting Space St. Croix because then I uh, was getting a lot of emails from teachers and schools that I was familiar with in Hudson, but then I started getting requests from the region like Woodbury or Edina or things like that. And I'd kind of set up my nonprofit to be, if you donated to it, all the money was going to Hudson programs. Mm -hmm. And so it was a, I was trying to figure out how, I didn't want to say no to anybody that wanted a program, you know, a library or a school or, or a museum that wanted, but how do you fulfill that without screwing up kind of what I'd set up for Space St. Croix mm -hmm. and Hudson. So I found out about through a colleague, uh, the NASA Solar System Ambassador Program. So that's a program where NASA has people, because as you might guess, they get a lot of requests for presenters and things like that. Right. And so they have a nationwide network of people that, that they interview and apply and they get trainings and then those people can kind of be surrogates for NASA and can uh, respond to official requests for a presentation or a program. So if somebody wants, for example, like the James Webb Space Telescope, it's in the news and they'd like to learn more about it and they're asking NASA for someone, a solar system ambassador in their region can fulfill that mm -hmm. request and then come present uh, to their program. So I got involved with them, I think, in 2017, because this is, I kind of got Space St. Croix in 2016, and then I started getting requests from all these other areas outside of Hudson. And so 2017, I got accepted as a NASA Solar System Ambassador, and I've been one ever since. And so that's kind of the way it goes. If I do something at the Science Museum of Minnesota or the Bell Museum, it's as a NASA Solar System Ambassador. And any program. It's like a speaker's bureau then, basically. Yeah, they, they provide online training. Yeah. Uh, they'll provide physical resources, handouts and materials related to the mission you're talking about. Mm -hmm. And then you do your reporting to NASA and how many people attended, you know, things like that. So they kind of keep track of their impact, you know, how many programs they're right. doing and things like that. It was not that long ago, a few years, 
before the pandemic that you actually had um, and you brought to the library the discs with um, oh, lunar, yeah, the lunar moon rocks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's a whole different you know, program too, but I got certified for uh, what they're called lunar and meteorite education discs. So they're a round disc about that big, uh, completely encased in lucite. So you can see right through it, it's very hard. You can't, don't have to worry about spilling anything on it, yeah. ruining the samples. But within that lucite disc are several samples from different Apollo missions and then uh, several meteorite samples. And so they're kind of numbered and identified so you can look up what you have in your disc. You know, you can cite the missions and where they, you can show on a map where they landed and where these samples are from. Uh, you can put them under a microscope and do things. So uh, I got certified for those, and, and yeah, brought those out to Hudson a few times. For yeah, and I, I remember you were either just starting as a librarian or, or maybe not quite yet, yep. but I was like, wow, so you know, we could take out an ad and we could put oh, this yeah. on Facebook. No. And, we could, and you're like, no, no. It's a, it's, people can see it, but we can't promote it. NASA has, I think rightfully so, a lot of rules that come with yeah. that. So I, I found out getting them that, yeah, you can use it for a program, but they don't want you to advertise that the disc's going to be at a place because they're worried about theft. Yeah. Uh, and even uh, protect... How do you even insure moon rocks? Yeah, when right? you sign the paperwork, it actually says priceless in the box. Yeah. For the value, so you're a little, you kind of look at it again before you sign because you, and so that's, the, they have, stand, it has to be in a secured location. When I'm not using it, uh, it has to be, I've arranged to have it at the police station or at a bank vault. That's kind of your choices for that. You, mm -hmm. you can't store it at a building or at your home. Fire, you know, anything that could happen. Not in so. the director's office. Right. No. And yeah. so you, you do have to make some of these arrangements right. beforehand because if I have it for a week or two, I have to f physically be able to arrange with uh, the, mm -hmm. the police department I did where I would be handing it to a police officer and they'd be putting it in their uh their um, evidence vault, I guess, would be the, the right term for that, you know, lie, secure location locking away. So, yeah, there's there's some oddities to it, but it's it's worthwhile because yeah. when people can get a selfie with, you know, holding uh, moon samples or see it with their own eye under a microscope and you can kind of talk about, uh, and then you can show them on a map, you know, where it came from and why, how these were obtained, and it's, it's a great way to kind of make the science come alive for people. Oh, for sure. Yeah. And to think that I would have ever had an opportunity to actually look at it a rock from space. I mean, yeah, and some it people, blew my mind. Some people have been able to see them in a museum. You've probably yeah. seen the things where it's like touch a moon rock and they'll have some of the different NASA facilities. But again, to try to bring it to Hudson for yeah. kids that haven't had that opportunity or been able to go to a NASA mm -hmm. field center, maybe that's the only shot you're ever going to get at seeing or holding a moon sample. So I thought it's a great program to kind of be able to bring back here. Right. All right, so we have uh, Moon, Mars, and Beyond. Yes. Through uh, March. Yes. So you can come and look at it any time, but we have Space Day yep. on January 20th, that's mm -hmm. a Saturday, from 10 to 2. two yep. So we're going to have lots of activities, um, some treats, yeah. um, people can yeah. play with the exhibits. I, I brought a few because we were talking about, we, uh, um, I was able to purchase some books uh, to okay. be as giveaways for that. So we have different uh, age levels and, and groups uh, coming in. So and we hear cat. Cats for not seems huge. to be a hit with the yeah the uh, the fifth grade group third to fifth grade group uh, they've talked to me about this before on Mr. Mick have you read Cats or not so uh, I knew that was a series that I had to get good some copies of to give away and then just some of the things that the kids can learn about like this we have they're familiar with the spacesuit they've kind of seen that iconic image of that yeah. but we actually have a sandwich it's called a sandwich but it's the layers of a real spacesuit. So this is from ILC Dover, the company that made all the uh, spacesuits for the shuttle back to the Apollo program. It kind of shows you. A little disco. Yeah, all the layers there and the cooling garment layer and that. that uh, so we kind of explained. And they can feel that and uh, get a better understanding of all the engineering that goes into a spacesuit. You know, to keep somebody with the, not only their air, but keeping the right temperature and shield them from the sun or from the cold and, uh, and that. So there's a lot of neat interactive things that we'll have like that. Great. It's going to be a good time. Yes. So thanks for coming over, and thanks everybody for watching. We'll see you next time.